Eugenie Sage. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We shouldn't be debating changes to our most important environmental law, the Resource Management Act, under urgency. We shouldn't be having government members moving premature motions to shut down the debate on part one of the bill, given that it makes so many substantive changes to the Act, and the Green Party continues to oppose this bill. We agree with the Greater Wellington Regional Council when it said in its submission, and I quote, the bill in trying to streamline the process seems to be making things more prescriptive, less accessible to public participation and more costly to councils with no provision for additional funding support. And in this third reading speech on the bill, I'd like to comment on two of the proposals in it, Clause 69 around cross-benefit analysis and the changes to State of the Environment reporting, because they highlight the anti-environment, anti-regulation, ideology and agenda which is at the heart of this bill. Section 32 of the Resource Management Act currently requires councils, when they're developing a plan or a policy, and the Minister, when she's developing a national policy or a national environmental standard, to consider the benefits and the costs of those rules or regulations and other methods, and the risks of acting or not acting if there is uncertain or insufficient information. And this evaluation is to ensure that the proposal is the best way to achieve the desired objective. The Green Party doesn't oppose these cost-benefit evaluations if they're done under the um, existing Act, because under the Act as it stands, there's no focus on the evaluation being largely an economic evaluation. But the Bill, through the changes it makes, through Clause 69, singles out two economic effects that must be included in this cost-benefit evaluation, and they are the opportunities for economic growth and the opportunities for employment that are anticipated to be either provided or reduced. There's no mention of opportunities for environmental enhancement, and as the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment said in her submission on the bill, and I quote, this does not in itself say that economic effects are to be given more weight than environmental, social and cultural effects, but the result will be that it will. Simply specifying these two economic effects while failing to specify other effects will unbalance a Section 32 evaluation." End quote. And that's what this bill is all about. It's about evaluating economic, short-term economic growth above other Part 2 matters. And that's what the whole tranche of changes that the government is making piece by piece to the Resource Management Act is about. It's about unbalancing the Act so that it becomes law that promotes short-term economic development at nature's expense rather than promoting sustainable management. And with this bill and the next one, the RMA will no longer be an Act which safeguards the environment and the needs of, short, of, of future generations. It will all be about economic development now. And what the John Key government is doing is making the RMA into a National Development Act, much like Sir Robert Muldoon uh, did with uh, the National Development Act at the time. And that's because the decision-making criteria in the Act are being substantially changed to promote uh, economic growth. They fail to recognise that a healthy economy is the, based on a healthy environment. The changes increase ministerial powers, they centralise um, decision-making, and they erode local democracy. They'll have more decisions being made behind closed doors in the Beehive rather than in the open uh, around the council table. And we see that with decisions like appointing the Auckland Hearing Panel and with the uh, changes to State of the Environment monitoring, where it'll be the minister who tells councils um, what uh, they have to do in terms of environment monitoring. And these changes to Section 32 and the whole cost-benefit analysis around plan making are really important because if a regional council, for example, is considering new plan rules to um, limit nutrient losses from dairy farming to protect water quality, they are going to have to analyse and quantify the economic opportunities and costs of doing this, but they won't have to specifically consider 
the environmental benefits, such as improving the um, health of a river, making it safer to swim in. So it's much easier to quantify those economic costs and benefits than it is to do um, to quantify the benefits of sustaining wildlife, allowing people to go rafting down a river, or ensuring that the river is healthy to swim in. So that means there will be much more of a focus on what's easily quantifiable and much more of a reluctance for councils to uh, introduce rules because they know that they risk being challenged in the Environment Court if they haven't done this economic analysis, if they haven't quantified uh, the costs and benefits. And, Mr Speaker, these changes will impose extra costs on councils because we heard in select committee that it costs councils between 3000 and 50000 to do a Section 32 um, evaluation. And because it's making the economic analysis mandatory, it means that will get for first call on council funding rather than one that evaluates the uh, environmental or cultural uh, benefits. If the Minister was genuinely interested in improving practice under the RMA, she would do some, or get her Ministry to do some generic analysis of the costs and benefits of subdivision controls, of land use controls to protect water quality. But the interest isn't in doing that. It's all about speeding up um, short-term decision-making uh, in favour of, of development interests. It's all about making an easier ride for miners, for irrigators, for agribusiness, for dam builders and property developers. And that means undermining the capacity of councils to regulate and have sound rules that protects environmental quality. And I'd like to um, follow up Nikki Wagner's comments about State of the Environment reporting. Certainly we want consistent measures around doing that, but this bill is about offloading onto councils the costs of doing State of the Environment monitoring rather than funding a robust and independent process through the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. The PCE estimated that it would cost her office about $1.6 million to employ the extra staff to do that. What does the bill do? It allows the Minister to direct through regulation which this Parliament will have no opportunity to scrutinise, and the Minister to say what, councils, um, what environmental indicators councils should use, what standards and methods they should use, but it's not about providing the funding to councils to do that. So what will that mean? This will be another cost to councils without central government providing any revenue to do that. So once again, the government is beating up on local authorities but it's not providing them with the revenue to do the job when it shifts extra costs onto them. We want robust State of the Environment monitoring, particularly when the government is promoting uh, more irrigation that's likely to reduce water quality. But what the government is doing is making sure that we will get patch, we'll not, um, we'll get lesser quality, less robust, less independent monitoring because the Minister is breaching the promises her predecessor made that it would be done by the Parliamentary Commissioner, that it would be independent. Instead, she will, through this bill, be telling councils what they have to do without providing them with the funding that allows them to do, um, to do that property, properly. So there's a whole lack of robustness there and councils were uh, quick to point out in their submissions that that will, as the Palmerston North City Council said, increase the costs associated with monitoring at a time when many councils are struggling to meet their existing monitoring requirements due to resourcing limitations. So once again, this bill is anti-environment, anti-regulation here and with the provisions around urban trees that will make it so much more cumbersome for councils to protect urban trees by requiring them to legally identify every single tree or group of tree that they want to apply uh, resource consent controls to. So that's the thrust of this bill and of the other legislation that the government is going to introduce later this year. It's all about short-term economic thinking, not about a smart green economy which recognises that the environment is the basis of that economy. Yeah. Honourable Phil Heatley. Mr Speaker, I, I rise to um, support... Uh